Well, greetings, church family. Today's daily Bible reading had us in Joshua chapter 9. And in chapter 9, verses 1 through 15, we see that after the Israelites wiped out Jericho and Ai, the rest of the residents of the promised land, the Hittites and Amorites and Canaanites and Perizzites, Hivites and Jebusites, they all decided to team up on the Israelites. And it was probably wise for them to do this, of course, hearing so much of how powerful this great people were, more importantly, how powerful the God they served was, and knowing that the city of Ai only had 12,000 people total, and, uh, and even just Joshua was crack troops was 30,000, so much more. They needed to team up against the Israelites if they were going to have a chance. But the citizens of Gibeon, they decide to use some subterfuge to stay safe from annihilation. So they get some worn out clothes and sandals and worn out supply sacks, worn out wineskins, dried out crumbled bread to help sell the lie that they came from a far country. See that in verse 6 of chapter 9. Uh, And and this is important to try and trick the people into making a covenant with them, to trick the Israelites. It's unknown if the people of Gibeon knew uh, of God's commands in Exodus 23, 32 and Deuteronomy 7, 2, that the Israelites were not to make any covenants with the people of the promised land. Uh, It's unknown, but certainly this worked out in the Gibeonites' favor to a certain degree, as we're going to see. Part of that shrewd craftiness of these Gibeonites is to actually refer to God's own character and actions in redeeming and protecting his people Israel as the reason they wanted peace with Israel. You notice this in chapter 9, as as they say in uh, verse 9, your servants have come from a very far country, there's the lie, because of the fame of Yahweh your God. We heard the report of him and all he did in Egypt. Verse 10, everything he did to the two kings of the Amorites who were beyond the Jordan, Sihon king of Heshbon, Og king of Bashan, right? So, so they're like, hey, we need to make a covenant with these people. Now, of course, there's no lie in that latter part, talking about the fame of the God of Israel, because Joshua 2.11 and Joshua 5.1 make it clear the people of the land were frightened at the power of Israel's God, Yahweh. But sadly, Joshua and the leaders of Israel make a crucial mistake. They make this covenant with the people, but the crucial mistake happens before that. Verse 14, look at the latter half of it. The people, the men of Israel, they take some of their provisions. They did not ask for the counsel of the Lord. They did not ask literally for the mouth of the Lord to hear God's wisdom in the face of what these Gibeonites were saying. And the making of peace with Canaanites, instead of driving them out of the land, that's sadly going to become widespread in Israel. We see that in Judges chapter 1, and the result is listed in Judges chapter 2, 1 through 3. The angel of the Lord actually comes up from Gilgal, same place exactly where the encampment is at this time. Joshua and his is an encampment at Gilgal. To Bochim, and he said, I brought you up out of Egypt and led you into the land which I have sworn to your fathers. I said, I will never break my covenant with you. And as for you, you shall make no covenant with the inhabitants of this land. You're going to tear down their altars, but you have not obeyed me. What is this you have done? Therefore, I also said, I will not drive them out before you, but they will become as thorns in your sides and their gods will be a snare to you. And this process has already begun. Israel is one and one in their conquering of the people. I guess two and one. They had one loss at I, and then they defeated I after that. And already they have failed in this promise, in this command that the Lord has given them to not make any covenants with the people of the land. And by the time the ruse is discovered, chapter 9, verses 16 through 27, it's too late. And how sad. The ruse is discovered just three days later. Oh, if only the people had sought God's counsel and waited patiently to discover the truth, then they would have not have made this foolish covenant with people of the land. And by the time they did realize that the Gibeonites had deceived them and they were from the promised land, Joshua and Israel's leaders knew they could not go back on a covenant they made in the sight of the Lord. And instead, they take the Gibeonites as a workforce for the altar of Yahweh. It ends up really as a lose-lose situation for the Israelites and the Gibeonites. The Gibeonites make peace, but they end up being essentially slaves for the Israelites. And the Israelites uh, are now left with uh, the Lord's judgment that's going to occur later in the book of Judges. Well, some principles and application, we see some three big ones here. First, how destructive deception is. Just a reminder of it. John 8, 44 describes Satan as the father of lies. When we engage in lies and deception, we are engaging in a satanic uh, adventure, right? A satanic situation. Proverbs 24, 28 makes it very clear. Do not be a witness against your neighbor without cause and do not deceive with your lips. Destructive deception. 
We must keep from it. If we serve the God of truth, then we ourselves need to be about the truth. Second, how foolish it is to make decisions without taking and listening to obeying the counsel of the Lord. I mean, God has given us a whole book, right, of scriptures for us to study so that we can make decisions which honor and glorify him. Jesus commands in Matthew 10, 16, uh, he says, I send you out as sheep in the midst of wolves, so be shrewd as serpents and innocent as doves. That's the command he gives to Christians, to those who are in the church. Proverbs eleven fourteen, we read where there is no guidance, the people fall, but in abundance of counselors, there is victory. We are to be shrewd as serpents. We need to not just take people at their word, but be able to use the scriptures and pray to the Lord and seek wise counsel from other godly men and women before we make decisions, big decisions, life-changing decisions. And that was something that Joshua and the Israelites failed to do. How sharply truthful, this is our third principle, and this is one to end it on a better note, in contrast to the deception of Satan. And, uh, and the deception that our flesh is all too quick to engage in. How sharply truthful the Lord in his gospel is. Listen to Titus chapter 1, verses 1 through 3, where Paul is writing to uh, one of his uh, children of the faith, Titus, a pastor on the Isle of Crete. It says, Paul, a bondservant of God and an apostle of Jesus Christ, for the faith of those chosen of God and the knowledge of the truth which is according to godliness, in the hope of eternal life which God, who cannot lie, promised long ages ago. But at the proper time manifested, even his word, in the proclamation with which I was entrusted according to the commandment of God, our Savior. God is truth, and he gives the truth, and his truth is his word, right? That's what he sanctifies us by. He saves us with the gospel that is proclaimed in his word, the gospel that uh, while his wrath will fall on those who commit sin, if you would only turn to him and trust in his salvation through his son, Jesus Christ, that he provided, Christ who died on the cross for our sins, then God will turn his wrath away and in fact already poured it out on Jesus for you if you will just trust in Christ alone for the salvation uh, from God's wrath, uh, that wrath that we deserve, you and I both. Uh, how wonderful to know that our God does not lie and if we indeed are in Christ, then we need to reflect that true character of his. We need to be truthful as well in our own lives. Well, this has been Joshua chapter 9, and I hope you have a great day.